we are partway through our series called One Thing. Just one thing. Many passages in the Bible have that phrase, one thing. And we've talked about one thing we seek or one thing we ask from Psalm 27, just to gaze on the beauty of the Lord. That's just about what's the most significant thing we could desire in life. It is to be in the presence of God. And then last time we talked about one thing we lack. And hopefully we don't lack that one thing in that rich man, which was simply an unsurrendered spirit. And really to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus, all you really need fundamentally when you boil it down is a surrendered spirit. So if we, if we ask if you just want that one thing to be in the presence of God and we have an, a surrendered spirit, we're, we're already going a long way to being in a good place spiritually. Now today, it's one thing is needed. One thing is needed. And we're here in Luke 10, if you want to turn there. We're in Luke 10. I don't think I asked anybody to read this, did I, this week? I don't think I did. Would someone like to with a reasonably loudish voice? Uh, Luke 10. It's just a short passage from verse 38 to 42. Would someone like to read that for us? As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. But only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Patricia. A few things are needed, or indeed only one. One thing is needed. What do we need right now in this world today, in your life, or in, uh, in our society, our world? If you, could, if you could fix one thing, one thing that's needed, what might that be? The, Joe? The abolishment of greed. The abolishing of greed. Wow, that would change a lot of things, wouldn't it? Excellent, thank you. Okay, Akin. Oh. Oh, get rid of social media. Get rid of social media. Whoa, <laughs> controversial. <laughs> Especially for those of you watching on the Facebook live feed, Akin would like to get rid of you. Absolutely. That's why Akin would like to do. Just bear that in mind. Okay, Pat. Reverse global warming. Reverse global warming. If we could just do that. Yeah. What else would you like to fix? One thing is needed. Hmm. What do the headlines tell us? And what do we think? Inflation. Inflation, bringing it down, bring that down. How about a simple thing like, please could I have the same level of energy I had when I was 25? Uh, I think I'd quite like that. Joe's still got it, but the rest of us, <laughs> the rest of us are human. Uh, one thing is needed. You know, sometimes we get confused about what is needed. Even good people get confused. Even Christians get confused. Even really faithfully loving God committed disciple Christians sometimes get confused about what's needed. And we see that in this, in this passage right here. So let me set a bit of context and then I'd like to ask you what you think, what you, why you think Jesus commends Mary and says she's doing the right thing and why he corrects Martha. So those are the two questions we're going we're gonna to have in a moment. What is it, what are the reasons why Jesus tells Mary she's doing the right thing and what is it that he's correcting Martha for? A little bit of extra context. There are some unusual things in this passage. In fact, can any of you notice, any of you notice what they are? What are some things that are unusual about this situation here? in this house, at least for the culture of the day. Simone? That it is a woman's house and not a man's house. So where, where is the bloke? Exactly. Right? Where's the man of the house? Which might mean 
it might mean that uh, the man of the house is simply out and Jesus has turned up unexpected. That's possible. Or it might mean that the man of the house is dead. So perhaps their father is dead. And given that in John we know about Lazarus, but no father figure, perhaps, perhaps there is no father figure around. Okay, what else is unusual about this scenario? What do you think? Is Leon is, oh no, you're moving the thing. Okay, the hand was going up there. Uh, anything else unusual? Okay, so she's, Mary is allowed to sit at the feet of Jesus to learn from him in a culture where women did not learn in that setting. They didn't learn in that setting. They would learn from who? Their husbands. They would learn from their husbands or possibly the father of the house, maybe. But uh, they wouldn't learn from a rabbi for a woman to sit at the feet of a rabbi, especially, or any man, really, and in a house, who, uh, a man who wasn't their husband or their father. It was scandalous, actually. It wasn't just not the done thing. It, was a, it would create a scandal in the local village. So some unusual things going on here. So, all right. What is Jesus commending Mary for? He says, uh, as she sits there, and Martha comes to talk to Jesus about it, that she has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. So, why is he commending Mary? What do you think? Because she sat listening at his feet. She sat listening at the feet of Jesus, okay? All right, what is that telling us? So, yes? She's prioritizing the most important thing. The most important thing, right then, at that point. Okay. What else? Because she's rebelling against cultural norms. <laughs> Standing she... up for her God-given right, which is not recognised in the society of the day. Okay. I didn't read that. <laughs> it's, it's the NPV, the new penny version. Uh, she's bucking the trend. She's, she's challenging societal norms on the basis of a relationship with Jesus. That's very significant. Yes. I actually recognise also that Jesus is not just your usual house guest, that your role is to entertain him. She's recognised that Jesus came for something more special and that she needs to pay attention to that rather than just do the usual of make sure your guest is comfortable. Mm -hmm. So she's recognising the significance of her guest. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jesus is not any old guest. He's one of a kind. Yeah. That's a really interesting point, which I hadn't thought of, but that's really good. Great. Anything else? Any other reasons why Mary is being commended by Jesus? I guess she wasn't afraid. She wasn't afraid? So is it, yeah. So ah. yeah, she wasn't yeah. afraid of what people were saying, think, uh, uh, what, what she was focused on, but we took all of that. You know, and, and she wasn't concerned about what they would say or not say afterwards after Jesus left. She was just really focused on. It's, that's a, such a good point. I hope you caught that, that she wasn't afraid. She wasn't afraid of what other people would think of what she did. She was, whether she processed that and thought, I wonder what people would think, but I don't care, I'll just sit here, or whether she just automatically did it, we don't know. <coughs> Excuse me, but she had the right approach to that. It doesn't matter what society think, what my family think, what even my sister thinks, I'm going to sit here, this is where I need to be. So courage, yes. Yeah. Anything else you think? Yes, Alice. She, she showed a lot of respect to Jesus because, first of all, she wasn't obeying the rules, but it was to respect, it was to worship Jesus. It, mm. It was to worship Jesus, to learn from him, showing him respect. Wasn't, isn't that a great answer? Thank you, Alice. That's right. It was a respect of Jesus above all other things. Simon? I think she's demonstrated an incredible amount of listening skills here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. She, she devotes herself to listening. Hmm. Yeah. Um, she's kind of taken a leap of faith. A leap of faith. Right. So it's kind of, you know, um, like when Jesus said to the fishermen, leave your family, leave 
you know, she's done she's done that really the way because she's doing something that wouldn't be deemed so it's interesting that that leap of faith, it connects with your point about courage, because isn't it so often the case that faith and courage go together? People of faith demonstrate courageous action, which may go against what other people would approve of, accept, or, or, or you might get criticized for that. Let me ask you a connected question. When can you think of another time when people sat at the feet of Jesus and Jesus commended them? Feeding of the 5,000 is one? Uh, perfume. Yeah. The woman who came to his feet? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. People sitting around him. Another time people sat around him. Children. The children, yes. Another time? And he, he, because they sat around him, he gave them a special status. He gave them a special, he told them, you have a special status now because you're here. I'm being a little cryptic. See if we can work this one out. People sat around. For the Last Supper? Not the Last Supper, but that's a good one. People got essentially a kind of accorded a special status because they were there in a house, actually, similarly, in a home. Lowered through the roof, good one. Uh, when he reappeared to the disciples after he, his resurrection? After the resurrection is a good one. I'm thinking of another one. We've got some good Bible knowledge here. <laughs> this is good. This is good. All right, I'll tell you. No, Patricia? I don't know if this is one, but he goes to the home of the tax collector. The home of the tax collector is another good one. Now, I'm thinking about the time when his family come and the people inside say, your family are outside looking for you. Yeah. And he says, who are my family? Mm -hmm. Those who are here, seated here. You are my family. And I think there's something very profound going on here where Jesus is essentially accepting Mary into his family. He's saying, you're family. You're that, it's that kind of relationship we have because you've sat and listened. You've devoted yourself. You've chosen what is better. She's chosen him as family. You could say perhaps even over Martha as her sister. Who is she going to, who is she going to seek to please? It's Jesus, rather even uh, the Martha. So effectively, she's joining his family and she allows Jesus, fundamentally from all the things we've shared, I think, he's allowing, she's allowing Jesus to fundamentally set her priorities. She adjusted her priorities according to those of Jesus. Her priorities, his priorities rather than the priorities of tradition, of custom, or what everybody else is doing, or what people close to her would think is right. She's putting the word first. Listening, the word there, listening, implies it's the same word used for when to listen and obey. It's that idea that I'm listening to then take action. So it's that kind of listening to Jesus. Luke 4 verse 4, Jesus said it's written, man shall not live on bread alone, not on Martha's hospitality alone. We shall live on my words. And she takes him seriously. Okay, what is Jesus correcting Martha for? And Martha gets a bad rap. And I, I, I don't think we should be too, too down on Martha here. But I think it's, we need to wrestle with the idea that she is being at least corrected. So what is she being corrected about by, by Jesus? Alice? Um, it's because she, she, isn't, she isn't, um, like, she's not She's saying that what, what Mary is doing is wrong and she should be obeying the rules. Mm. But Mary was just like respecting Jesus and like Okay, that's right. So uh, Martha is sticking to rules that are not appropriate at that point, you could say. Yeah, okay. She is uh, worried about things in her life that she maybe don't have any control over. I don't know, but, but she's worried. She's worried. She's letting her worry dictate her priorities. Okay, I'd, I'd agree with that. All right. What else, or why else is Jesus correcting Martha here? What do you think? I guess Martha's doing the right thing. She hasn't chosen the better thing. It's sort of, yeah, it's, yeah he's, still, so he's correcting. He wasn't telling her off, actually. He, wasn't, he was just saying, look, 
choose, choose the right priorities. What you're doing is good, but there's something important right now. You're, choosing, you're doing good, but there's something more important. Mm. Mm. Yeah, good, thank you. Any other thoughts? Why is Jesus correcting Martha? Martha's got a mind on physical things, Jesus, uh, Mary on spiritual things. Okay. Yep. Any other ideas? What's going on here? It is interesting that Jesus is not, I think he's not rebuking Martha, but he is correcting. Sorry, there was a hand. Yeah, sorry. Um, I think it's it Martha's, Martha's doing what most siblings do, which is try and get the other one in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> get the other sibling in trouble. It's like, oh, you know, she's not doing what she's better be doing. <laughs> you need to correct her. Sort out my family problem for me, Jesus. I think Jesus is trying to point out what, what is really the issue here, you know. He did that with a parable, didn't he? When one, a man came to him and said, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And then he tells a parable to correct that chap. Yeah, that sibling rivalry is, uh, uh, it starts with Cain and Abel and continues through, through the whole of human history. So any other things, any other reasons? Yes. About what's eternal, and Jesus said, "Look, Mary's chosen what's better; it will not be taken away from her." There's, there's a time in the busyness of life mm. to remember what is enduring. And I mean, the ladies—we talked about this, about how you know, even post-COVID, starting to reopen our homes, and there's the usual panic of, "Are the toilets clean? Are there enough, enough clean mugs? Is there enough milk?" You know, oh, I haven't got any biscuits or whatever. There is that. And the place needs to be clean before the grand invasion. <laughs> and it's, and yet, and those are important things, and, but they don't last forever. Mm -hmm. and, and in the busyness of life, I suppose, to me, God is giving Martha to think about what, what has, what really lasts and right. what is enduring. Right. Yeah, what, what, what will matter 10 years from now? Yeah. Right, the state of the home today, this day when Jesus arrives, that, you're not going to be thinking about that. At least hopefully not. <laughs> but you might be thinking about what you learned that day. Yeah, so what's of lasting value? Good. Any, anybody else? That's an interesting thought, Patricia, because, I mean, to be worried or upset is not in itself a sin or a spiritual problem. It's what you do with it. And it seems as if, because Jesus does say, you are worried and upset about many things, that there's more of a perhaps an undercurrent of anxiety and fear and worry going in her life that perhaps she's not dealing with. Maybe. Hard to be sure, but it could be something going on there. Many things. Interesting. Well... Let me summarize, and then we'll take communion. I think all of what we said is right, and it all points back to, I think, one central point, which is that Martha chose what was good when she had the opportunity to do something that was better. And she chose wrong. She chose inappropriately. Or she chose not according to what was best. Is it good to offer hospitality? Well, it's a very high value in the Bible, isn't it? It's a really high value. Hospitality is commanded in Scripture. So it's not like she's doing something that the Bible doesn't command. But her priority is the hospitality instead of the priority being Jesus himself. And that's where the good got in the way of the best. And I don't know about you, but in my Christian life, as often as I might struggle with sin as a problem, I think perhaps even more often than that, the, the times when I don't feel like I'm growing in my Christian life, or I'm not having much impact uh, for people in my Christian life, or I'm not really pleasing God as much as I could in my Christian life, is more often to do with the fact that I'm choosing something that's good when I could be choosing something that's better. I think it's just something worthwhile thinking about for all of us, personally. How much of our life is filled with things that are good when they could be filled with something that's better.
instead of. And I, I don't like giving too many practical examples because it narrows it down and I don't know all of our circumstances, but it's things like and entertaining ourselves when we could have phoned somebody or sent a message or, or we could have done something on our own and we might be able to do it together with another friend or a, or a member of the church. Or it's, it's about, largely, it's about God and people, isn't it? Because so much of life is the horizontal, if you like, with God. No, the vertical with God and the horizontal with human beings. And Jesus kept bringing people back to this. It's about people and it's about God. And the one thing passages remind us, it's about people and it's about God. So that anything that takes us away from a meaningful time with God, a time of prayer, a time of study, a time of learning, anything that takes us away from people, those things might be good, but are they the best? And I have to leave that with us to wrestle with for our own personal circumstances, because it's going to vary, of course, person to person. But maybe do a bit of an inventory, look at your calendar for the week ahead. How many of the things are best and might be compromised by what is, what is good? Let's think about that and pray about that because the wrestling in the Christian life is largely about choosing what is better. Because that's what she get, Mary gets commended for. She chose what was better. And as you said, Penn, it won't be taken away. In, that, in other words, the relationship she's establishing or having, enjoying with Jesus here at his feet, that will not be taken away. That's what's better. And that relationship is, is what it's all about. And that's why we take bread and wine. We're going to in a moment. We're going to take some bread and wine because it reminds us how lucky we are to have a relationship with him. That he's come into our lives. He's, hopefully we're being hospitable to him into our lives. And that's what he wants to do. He wants to reside with us. He wants to live with us. And it's the cross and the resurrection that make that possible makes it possible for us to have this relationship uh, with him. Jesus had many choices to make in his lifetime on this earth. He always chose what was better. He could have stayed on this earth another 30, 40 years doing good. One of the summaries of his ministry in Acts is that he went around doing good. He did a lot of good. He could have stayed doing good, but he chose what is better to go to the cross. That was a tough choice. <laughs> that, that was a lot of faith and trust and courage we've talked about. And Mary gives us a microcosm of perhaps our response as well. So as we pray together, let's uh, reflect on all this and just try and ask God to set our hearts this week to choose what is better over what is good. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this, this time that's recorded for us this visit to the, ho the home of Mary and Martha. Thank you that we have it here in the gospel. Thank you that we can reflect on it. And thank you, thank you that Mary opened her home to Jesus, uh, that Martha opened her home to Jesus. Without that, none of this would have happened. And thank you that Martha wanted to be hospitable to your son, Father. But also thank you for the example of Mary, that she chose to sit. She desired Jesus more than anything. And we can pray and trust that Martha got that point too, because we see later in the Gospels that she's, she's with you, she's with Jesus. So we thank you that she had an open heart and pray it help us to have an open heart to, to correct where the good is getting in the way of the better. Help us to recognize for ourselves what that means for our lives right now. Help us always choose what is better, to sit at your feet, Jesus, to learn from you, to be part of your family to be with you not only now but forever, to choose what is good, what is better now, that will have an impact for many years to come. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for this bread and wine that reminds us of the body broken and the blood that was shed, that you gave your best so that we could enjoy what is good and even better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.